When the average American thinks of the L.A. underworld, they usually think of Crips and Bloods, but little was known about L.A. kingpins outside of California. The typical baller names that always pop up, Harry O, Waterhead Bo, and the most famous of them all, Freeway Rick. But there's so many more players, so many more hustlers that played a huge part in the game, including the godfather, Tootie Reese. Before Free Base, PCP, and the crack era, there were several big name high rollers that hustled the streets of Los Angeles. Whether it was heroin or powder cocaine, the one name we always heard was Thomas Tootie Reese. In the 1970s, Tootie supplied almost every major black drug dealer in the game on the West Coast, including Oakland's own kingpin, Felix Mitchell. In season six, we're going to touch on a few of those names, faces, and stories. And here we begin with the man that turned $300 into millions, John Boy. Yeah, uh, I come from South Central, born and raised uh, in South Central. I uh, went to uh, 61st Street School. I went to Bethune Junior High School, went to Fremont High School. Grew up over there in 80th and Figueroa. Moved over there with my family when I was 15. I met Freeway Rick when he was 13. We became friends. And then in 1978, after I graduated in 1976, I decided to uh, put together a dance group called the Robot Brothers, me and my two brothers. And we went on the God Show, won first place. Went on Soul Train, went on Shoes and Your Nail Show and then end up on the Johnny Carson Show, becoming the first black dance group on the Johnny Carson Show in 1979. Interest. Uh, when you think of the 80s, what do you think about that stands out the most to you? The 80s, for me, uh, it was a period where it was good. It was good for a lot of people. Uh, in 1982, I uh, decided to get into the drug game with $300 uh, and didn't know anything about drugs because I never got high before, never had a drink, still haven't had a drink or got high in 62 years. Uh, but I heard that there was a lot of money in drugs. What type of drugs was this that you purchased? Cocaine. It was, it was, uh, I bought a gram, oh, actually three grams, I call a track for $300. That mean that was $100 per gram? Yes. And what year was that? 1982. Absolutely, because I was trying to rec get my recollection together. I believe back then, and quote me if I'm wrong, I believe a bird was going for a hundred dollars. Yes. I stayed in the drug game for about nine months, made about two million, and I got out of the game. And then from there, in '85, I opened up the first nightclub in Marina del Rey called Casanova, becoming the first African American to open up African American business in Marina del Rey. And then from there, uh, the rest were history. I bought me a nice home, had, you know, got engaged, had a daughter, and I uh, just lived my life until 1988. I got, uh, I got busted, uh, you know, trying to purchase uh, 225 kilos. So you, you saved all your money up to get to the two million? Yes. And then you didn't get out the game, you stayed in the game? No, I got out the game. I got out the game after nine months. And then, and how, then I bought a home in the business. And then how does the case come into play? Well, in 1989, or 1988, what happened, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Rayford, I don't know if you guys know him from Washington, D.C., uh, he came to me, wanted to buy my nightclub for $2 million cash, and I told him no. And then that was uh, on uh, 1988, that was uh, New Year's Eve. Later on that night, somebody got shot. And that day forward, everybody was afraid to come to my club. So someone came to me and said, man, I need to buy some drugs just to help you get back on your feet. Otherwise, you may lose your club. I saw how much I need 100. I did 100. I need 225. And we did a 225. It gave me $3 million. I and mean, when we got there with a the steam by the sheriff department and I end up going to prison. Hmm. Interesting job, boy. 
Professor Melly Mel, the Hood Post man here with KM Videos with Content is King. Um, how did it feel in the 80s, man? When, what was the, your first recollection of that being a millionaire? How did you actually, when you woke up as a millionaire, how did that feel for you? I mean, back then, words can explain. I mean, you know, I'm 22 years old with $2 million. You know, from prior to that, we were all living in a two bedroom apartment. I had five sisters, two brothers, and my mom and dad, so with 10 of us in a two bedroom apartment, my mother on welfare. So for me, it, it, it felt my whole world changed, you know, just overnight. So when you when you first met, let's go back to Ray to also. When you first met him, was that like, was you introduced to him or it was just somebody pointed you out to him and he made an introduction? introduction no, to no, he was introduced to me. He was introduced to me and then he, every time he came to LA, he would come to my nightclub. Uh -huh. And so what what would you do? Like set him up or was it was the bottles popping back then? Oh yes, yeah. Don yeah. Perry off. Yes. Yes, yes. So he have he I gave him VIP status. Okay, so how did that relationship how many years did it take for that relationship to come together to where uh, you guys actually got into the money game? Well actually when I first um, first uh, someone introduced me to him over the phone because the person I was dealing with was working with him, so I met him over the phone. And then when he came out to LA, he wanted to come to my club and meet me face to face. So we only met actually twice, you know, but the deal was, you know, with the other person. Back then, cocaine was very powerful and potent, and it was real cocaine. Yes, not even a gram. It was a hundred dollars. Yes, but correct. What, what we do often is we take a step on it and give it, make it a. a a bird and a half. Yes. That was where the profit was. Correct. Correct. Okay, good. So, going back but, to... Okay. But I never cut my drugs. You never cut it? Never cut That's why I always sold out. They say, go to John Boy, he don't cut his dough. I just get it from the Colombians and the Mexicans. I just bought it. So you would just it put an extra yeah. ticket on No, I, I just charged what it charged. 60000 80000 I, I didn't care. You mentioned Colombians and Mexicans. Yes. When did the Mexicans come into play, take over from the Colombians? Okay, well, the Mexican guy that I met, first it was one Colombian that I I uh, introduced to, I bought maybe like two kilos from him. Then uh, I couldn't locate him anymore, and number change of pager. So then I went to go get my, my vet painted in Paramount, and the guy that owned the paint, paint shop said to me, hey, Nigo, do you, do you do coca? I said, I don't do it, but I sell a little. He said, let me show you something. So he came and showed me like some keys and the bricks. And I said, wow, he said, I give you five kilos on consignment. You want to buy? I said, yes. So he and I, he became my connection. That's how I met him when I took my car to get painted. That, that that story resonates because that's that's basically you know L.A. Compton kind of love that's our story you know what I mean because they had to find a way to build rapport and often it was through painting cars and body and fender for some reason or mechanics you know yes. for some reason that was like the line of uh, connection if, if I'm not mistaken yes at least that was my experience and also that was your experience correct. Okay, so in the 80s, right, there was bumps and curves in the 80s that, you know what I mean, because you, there was a lot of people moving around. How did that, how did you overcome some of those bumps and curves in the 80s? When I'm saying bumps and curves, because there was a lot of people at that time was getting money, and then other people was hating on other people, not necessarily L.A. guys, but, you know, because the East Coast recognized, you know, the money was coming in the L.A. and then spreading out. So how did, did you ever, in, did that have an impact on you in the 80s? No, not really, because I, when I started, I started early, you know, uh, crack cocaine really didn't become popping until 84, 85. So by me having it two years before 84, I got in, I got out. I never really wanted to be a drug dealer. I just wanted to help my was family. A yeah, I was a businessman. I wanted to make enough, help my family, help my mom get a house so we could, you know, stop, you know, sitting around the house wishing that we had food to eat. Had nothing to do with a brand new Cadillac. I was just thinking about food, shelter, house, 
stuff like that. So I got in, got out. I never wanted to be a drug dealer. So did the gangs impact you any kind of way, or were you you were familiar with them, of course, by being in L.A. But how did you maneuver through those? What the Crips and Bloods? Uh -huh. Oh, because I sold to them. <laughs> I had a spot over there on Hyde Park in Victoria, so I sold to the 60s. I, you know, I sold over there, I sold some of my drugs over to, uh, uh, my mom had a, a place over there in the 30s. And I met with the young Huckabuck and all them dudes, so, so my brother was a crip. So I kind of knew them over there. Could you and, say what you know, city from? Uh, Harlem. Okay. Yeah, 30s in Harlem. You know, so, and then I knew, you know, you know, then I knew from neighbor Goward, you know, over there, some Watts. So, and I went for Fremont. So I was able to go there. And I just gave everybody, I said, oh man, I only got a hundred dollars. Okay, take the track, call me when you're done. And so I just kind of, I gave, I put a lot of people in the game, you know. Yeah, Rene McGowan was a staple, man, because he yeah. showed a lot of people. Yeah, he did. He, just, he and I sold drugs to each other. I, I bought a 10 kilos from him right before he died. and. And prior to that, he said, Johnny, five keys. So he was, uh, he was, he was cool with yeah, it. Mr. Rene, as they were. Yeah, he was cool. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, okay, once you came on, let's go back to your high school days. So in high school, what was that like going to Fremont? Uh, it, it was fun. I mean, you know, uh, 99 Was the games having any impact back then? No, I mean, they were there, but, you know, were I met Raymond Washington. No, no, I, I would just, a regular guy that that just went to school and hung out with everybody and knew a lot of the people and and after high school uh it was impactful because in 1978 when i put together this dance school with my brothers and i then we started going back to the school and dancing so more people we became famous you know, so that gave you a pass? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I so mean, you knew Raymond Washington? Yeah, but he used to be over there on 74th in San Pedro, those apartments, right? All the Crips hang out. So when we would walk down San Pedro to go home to 71st, hey, where are my brothers? Come over here, man, dance for the homie. And my brother, no, 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 they're going to jump on us. And first I was kind of nervous. So we went over there, we kind of did a step. Oh, yeah, cool, yeah, yeah, we're good. So we left. every time we see them, they call us and do a little dance step. So. I never had a problem, you know what I'm saying? You know, we never really had a problem because they knew we wasn't in a game. We were just dancers and that was it. So, who are some of the major players? I don't know if you can name them. Like, some of the major players that you felt that was on your level. Because two or three million dollars, that's a lot of money. Oh yeah, well, uh, little Tommy was on my level. Uh, he probably, he made more. Freeway Rick, of course. You know, got in the game and blew up. Uh, Whitey, you know, they had a spot two blocks from me. Uh, they blew up, you know. That's Whitey in the prize. Yes. And uh, my brother named Marty was good. Ghost from Long right. Beach. He was, he was, he did good. He wasn't, I don't think he was quite on our level, but he was trying to get there. Uh, Harry O. You know what I'm saying? I knew all of them before they got in the game. Black Dave, you know, with my boy, you know, uh, you know, I remember Dave coming up to my club. I said, John, well, come up to the car, let me show you something. I remember when he first started. And then he showed me, he had a, a, a I think it was Mercedes or Volvo station wagon. And he showed me like six million in the truck. He said, Just look, like man. That. Yeah, he said, look, look at this. You know, because when we, we, we all knew each other, we, we were just, you know, little track here, rocks. But he blew up and wanted to show me how he Deep made question, it. question, John. Why is it that the L.A. ball, I'm talking about, we had millionaires out there. Yes. But not is not, when it comes to the media side of it, or how they highlight uh, the guy from, what is his name, from Matthews, from New York, and uh, what's the other guy? It's another guy, uh, not Bumpy Johnson. What's the other guy? Frank Lucas. Frank Lucas. Okay, how they highlight those guys and give those guys a lot of credit, but really, a lot of that stuff really started right here in our home. Absolutely. And then spread it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, so, and, but, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say the Don Divas don't even write about it. You know what I mean? They had the opportunity to do it, but they didn't. 
you know, your thoughts? I mean, I, I, I think because it was an East Coast paper, you know, magazine, I think they concentrated on those East Coast, you know, uh, brothers that was in the game, you know. But in L.A., you know, we, we the way we rolled back in the early 80s, we had colds, you know, we didn't tell, we didn't snitch, we wasn't rats, we can't come and talk to, we didn't take pictures, you know. So we were more cautious, so maybe maybe that could be their reason for not approaching brothers from L.A. Do you think that the gang culture structured us in a way for that? I mean, because a lot of guys were, they transferred the skills from that to that, from transferred from gang to ball to being rich. Uh, and I'm not saying that's your circumstance. Yeah, yeah, correct. I, I think that perhaps those that's transformed from game banging to the drug game probably still lived up to their code. But then a lot of people that I named, we were not game bangers, but we associated ourselves, we knew them. So I think that we just knew better. We knew to keep your mouth closed, don't you say, say you nothing. You know these two guys, man. They two guys that I met when I was in the field. I'm thinking of that. was JB yep. and, and Lil D, man. Yeah. They was, I mean, you know, man, I love the two guys. They from the Bay, you yes. know what I mean? The Yay area, yeah. the Bay, you know what I mean? Yeah, they were cool. I really respect, respected their their thoughts and, and, and how they approached it, you know what I mean? And I understand that it's geographically different and culturally different, but yet we all count. You know what I mean? How was your relationship when you met those guys in the Fed? Well, I feel the same way you felt. I mean, I felt that they was, you know, they had their head on straight. They were straight shooters, you know, nice. You know, uh, didn't, were the shit starters, you know. And I would sit down with J Dubs and just talk to them and, you know, and uh, I, th I thought they were some solid, solid brothers. Good, good. Let me ask you. How much of an impact do you think gangs had on spread crack throughout the United States? I'm not sure because I don't know how deep that the gangs, you know, gang bangers got into the drugs. I mean, you know, I don't know. I know my brother, he wanted to get in the game and I put him down, and but he was only in it for a short minute. So what inspired Pick that book up. Show it to the bottom. What inspired the rolling eighties, man? Because that's like been like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Chris Shaw and Rodeo, man. Tell us about that. Well, what inspired me to write this book uh -huh. is that I, I wanted to tell my life story, you know, from a kid uh -huh. and how I grew up not having anything but wanted to have everything, and how I went from hustling bottles, you know. Uh, to uh, to uh, more law, uh, buying a mini bike, charging ten cents, twenty five cents for people to ride. So you was always uh, a hustler. From day one, I was a natural born hustler. I tell people that the natural born hustler, that the wanna be hustlers, that the I wish I was a hustler, <laughs> a praying hustler, a hand me down hustler. <laughs> I was a natural born hustler. Natural born hustler. Yeah, That's a good yeah, yeah, right yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't matter what what you have. You can hustle anything for you. Just have that hustle uh, DNA. In it. Right. So that's what inspired me to write the book. Right. And how many books you have all together? Forty two. Forty two. Wow, that's great. But the time you were there with me over there at Turn Island, you were you were working on a book then. You were yes. Bone, right? Yes. How's Bone? He doing okay. I spoke to him about seven months ago. He doing good. Still trying to prom Publish that book that I wrote. Okay. Yeah. Good enough. Good enough. Speak to him again and tell him I said hello. I will. I, I got a question. When you sure. first started, how did you accumulate your customers? Uh, I knew a couple people that was in the industry, Hollywood. So a young lady I used to date, she knew... Marvin Gaye, she knew Phyllis Hyman, she knew uh, Slider Family Stone, she knew these guys, so I would give her the cocaine raw. She didn't want rocks. She didn't want it raw, repackage it, and sell it to them. I actually met Slider Family Stone. In 83, I went to his Hollywood Hills house and sold him two ounces. And uh, he lived reaching his boot, 
it gave me like $4,800, $4,200 because it was $2,100 each house. So that's how I really got started. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, man. So what other celebrity experiences? Because I knew back then in the early 80s, the celebrities were all Ooh. over us. Because yeah, I remember meeting them at the airport hotel over there by the farm and meet them up in Hollywood, as you used to say. You know what I mean? Because they, they just wanted it. You know, and they didn't care because I don't know if it was running out up there because they start reaching really down Correct. further in Correct. the city to get what yes. they wanted. You know what I mean? And at that time, you know, you know, celebrities really that really wasn't their thing as no. far as reaching down. But Correct. something happened. What do you think happened? What made them do that? I think the prices. I think that what happened. The prices, you know, because a grand was a hundred dollars. Now they get a grand for seventy-five. And then they get a grand for fifty. You know, it kept going down. And I think that they figured that they get the same dope for half price, but really it wasn't the same. You know, when you really think about it, it, it was a cut on it. Shaka Khan, Natalie Cole, yeah, Natalie Cole. Yeah, I started dating Natalie Cole back in '88. What was that like? Oh, she was a nice person. Nice person. Did it open a lot of doors for you? No, because I was just, I wasn't looking for any doors. I had a nightclub, you know, I had a home. I just, we met. I thought she was a nice person. I met her son. And that was it. Tell, tell us about your nightclub. Did high rollers come there? Did prostitutes oh, come there? High rollers? I mean, they could have been prostitutes. I don't know. Undercover hoes, if you want to call it, but Magic Johnson, all the Lakers, um, uh, Bobby Brown, them, I let them perform there, Lou Ross, uh, Stevie Wonder would give a party there every year for his mother, um, uh, Nancy Wilson came there and performed for me, uh, Janet Jackson used my club for three months to rehearse. Uh, it, it was, it was, it was the hottest club, the hottest club in, uh, in Marina Del Rey back then. Did your fast Eddie's and Tootie Reese's come through? Oh, uh, yes. Eddie was a friend of mine. Tootie was. Rest in peace. He was a friend of mine. Uh, and, uh, it was, uh, it was all good. Mm. Any other big name, high rollers? Come through there. Oh, all of them came there. I mean, every every drug dealer that was a drug dealer that was a hustler that was doing the damn thing in LA hung out at Castle Dollars. Freeway Rick would rent the club on Sundays for all his workers and the guys from over there in Hoover. And I let him have the whole club. Interesting. Did you sell food in there? I sold food for the first six months, and then it was just too difficult. And then I just say now nah, just straight club and entertainment. Alcohol? Oh yes. I had a, I had my own liquor license at, at a, I was twenty six years old. Liquor license in my name, which is which was big. Most people were in a club. I actually owned a liquor license. How much was the liquor license more back then? So back then I had a connection where I was able to get the liquor license for eighteen thousand and they were going for like a hundred thousand. Hmm. That was a good hookup. <laughs> yes. So you was pretty successful in the in the business field as well, the legal business. Yes, sir. I did well in the illegal business with drugs, <laughs> and then my nightclub made over three million uh, before I sold it. And then later in 1993, I came back and opened up the first African American home health care agency and made 12 million in one year. Hmm. So let's see if my map. <laughs> <laughs> if my math is correct, you was worth twenty-four million at that point. Close. Yeah. Uh, so look, when you caught your case, did they take your money or anything? Uh, yes, they took everything that I had back then, uh, and uh, I did three and a half years off of six, and then when I came home a year later, I had my healthcare business in '93. That I was released in '92. That was federal time. Yeah. No, state. State. And the state seized your property? Uh, no, I sold everything before. I, I got busted. Oh. My plan was to sell everything, the home I had in Pasadena, to build a mansion 
in Bel Air Crest. Hmm. That was the 88. I went to jail in the 88, came home in 91, 92, started my healthcare business, and then I built my mansion in Bel Air Crest, which, which Eddie Murphy, Denzel Washington, uh, Janet Jackson, uh, and Ron Isley, the agent, tried to want to offer me to buy my mansion. I was like 34 years I said, no, no, I want to live in it. And I didn't sell it. What attracted you to Bel Air? Well, honestly, I just wanted to be behind the gate. I want to be behind the gate, feel that security, be around other race and group of people uh, that were doing something positive. You know, I didn't want to worry about my house getting broken in, getting robbed, getting jacked. You know, I just wanted to be a regular citizen. Right. Did you have a relationship with Devil? Yes, he's my one of my best friends. Really? Yes, we hang out every every other Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> be sure to give me my love, man. I, 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 I would call him before I leave. Before we, selling, I would man. call him when we finish. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was my cellie in Yeah, nice guy. Yes. So, what year did you get out of Turtle? I left, 2006, I went back to uh, Lompoc uh -huh. and did two more years and then I released. So upon release, what was your what was your plans? Uh, publish back. my publish my book, you know, one of my books, uh -huh. and which when I came, released in 19, 2008, I had a book called uh, Power of the V, uh -huh. and I ran into a friend of mine, Al, uh, Al Patron, that was friends with Ice T. He hooked me up, which I've been knowing Ice T since '78. He hooked me up with Ice T. He invested in my book project, and uh, and from there, I just kept on promoting and writing books and and doing different things. Being the businessman that you are, man, he was all business even there, man. Even in jail, yeah, even in prison. I remember the warden said, "I know you're not coming back, Mr. Watts. You stay in that library." No, sir. Yeah, we spent a lot of time. I remember yes. a lot of guys used to even try to criticize me. Like a I get a gym membership when I get out. Correct. Yes. I need to go to law library right now. Correct. Because one day here is too long for me. I don't know about you. I'll just yeah, speak absolutely. Absolutely. The importance was a priority for me. Correct. You know, and it worked out. I, I gave back twenty-four months and got back five months money. Yes. It worked out. Okay. Yeah. But so again, man, you can't talk about the eighties enough because the eighties. I know that's primed that, the way, that man. period. That period. Oh. Will we ever see that again? No. Well, that's, it came and it's gone. It's gone. So what? We say, if, if you wasn't part of the eighties, <laughs> what do all we you could do is just listen to us. Blockchain, uh, multiple streams of income, NFTs. What are we doing today? Right now, I'm still as a uh, uh, published author, you know, still uh, doing my thing with that. Uh, just got into the NFT uh, space, you know, because I have art and I have an uh, animated show I'm trying to get picked up called The Blunt Heads. Uh -huh. oh, uh, going they're going good. And uh, well, uh, my best friend Ice T and I are working on a docuseries called King Pins of LA. And who are some of the kingpins that's going to be featured? Uh, we have uh, Ghost, uh, Whitey, Freeway Rick, Little Tommy, um, Big Marty, uh, Killer, Beer Can. No, no, this is a woman. She calls herself Killer. Uh, Beer Can. And, um, yes, yeah, correct. And, uh, and myself.